Again, good morning. My name is Evelyn Blanco and I am a human resources advisor for Outlook HR. Thank you so much for your attendance this morning. We know you are all busy uh, and we appreciate uh, the time you're investing and we hope that we you find this webinar useful and, and helpful in uh, managing um, your uh, HR component within your business. Um, so, the topics today, uh, the key topic will be AB5, uh, but we will be um, going over a few other things. And I want to let you know that it's going to look like a lot of information, and it is, uh, but these are uh, legislations and law alerts that have come um, through in the last couple of weeks that I thought it was important to bring these uh, to your attention. But uh, we will save uh, the, the meat of the content for AB5. So uh, we're going to go over the following uh, topics today. Uh, Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act, COVID-19 and immigration suspensions, the Supreme Court um, upholding DACA, COVID-19 and taxpayer relief for retirement plan distributions or loans, and then um, SCOTUS rules federal law prohibits employment discrimination against LGB LGBTQ um, employees. And then uh, in large <laughs> letters there, I have AB5 because that is going to be the crux of what we discuss. So again, uh, let me just repeat, we're going to just briefly touch on the first five and then dig in much deeper with AB5 and hopefully be able to answer some questions um, that you may have as um, participants. So uh, Paycheck Protection Flexibility Act. So on June 5th, President Trump signed um, legislation enacting the PPFA, which amends the CARE Act's payroll protection program. For those of you who, who receive the PPP for your business as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this basically expands uh, their ruling from eight weeks to 24 weeks, whichever is earlier. Um, and um, it effectively immediately is um, immediately applicable to all loans as if the language were originally a, a, a part of the CARES Act. CARES Act. However, you must uh, choose to retain the eight week covered period um, prior to June 4th. Um, Workers must be rehired um, was extended from originally June 30th to December 31st, 2020, and rehiring requirements were relaxed um, through a new loan forgiveness exemption based on employee availability from uh, February of 2020 to December 31st of 2020. Um, it's going to go on and there's uh, more information here, um, but uh, again, we're just touching briefly. So this is the crux of it. This presentation, as always, will be emailed out to you so you can read in more de detail on each individual topic. So the next thing is COVID-19 and immigration suspensions. Uh, June 22nd, President Trump continued and expanded limitations on immigration during, during uh, COVID-19, um, suspending entry of immigrants and non-immigrants who present a risk to the U.S. labor market following the outbreak of the coronavirus. Uh, this is an extension of an original proclamation um, and um, accordingly entry to the U.S. pursuant to any of the following non-immigrant visas is prohibited. So if you have an H-1B visas, 
employees or H2B visas. Um, these are things you're going to want to be aware of, J visas and L visas. And again, uh, more content to follow with a lot of detail. Um, but this is information that uh, may be critical depending on what your um, industry and business are. And then the Supreme Court upholds DACA, uh, you know, the Dreamers Act. So basically, um, yeah, the decision is uh, to rescind the deferred action. I'm sorry, uh, on June, 20, June 18th, uh, the Supreme Court uh, of the U.S. ruled in the uh, in Department of Homeland Security versus Regents um, that uh, the decision to rescind the, the DACA program was arbitrary and capricious under Administrative Procedures Act. So basically, it's going to be upheld um, and will remain unless um, there's any future legal action. COVID-19 and taxpayer relief for retirement plan distributions or loans. This is important if you have any of those programs for your employees, um, but it released guidance um, for distribution and loans from retirement plans under the CARES Act Qualified individuals may treat uh, COVID-19 related distributions up to 100,000 from their eligible retirement plans um, between January 1st and de December 30th of 2020. They're not, not subject to the 10% additional tax that otherwise generally applies. They can be included um, in income and equal installments over a three year period and individuals have three years to pay repay the distribution to a plan or IRA and do un to, to undo uh, the tax consequences. Okay, it also allows um, plans to suspend low repayment, loan repayments that are due from March 27th through the end of this year, and the dollar limit on loans made between March 27th and September 22nd is increased from 50,000 to 100,000. Again, more language um, that you can review um, once you receive the presentation. Okay, SCOTUS rules federal law prohibits employment of discrimination against the LGBTQ community um, employees. This is important um, because now this will be added into the uh, protected classes under Title VII. This was signed in on June 15th. It is considered a landmark uh, decision. And um, should you have any questions, again, speak to your HR advisor. If you have a transgender or anybody in the LGBT community as an employee that brings forth a claim, you wanna treat it with hit gloves, you wanna handle it very carefully, and uh, you wanna make sure that you seek um, HR professional guidance and or legal counsel. Um, again, more language and uh, uh, I, I can strongly encourage you that if you have any of these issues, you definitely want to seek out some guidance. So, and then finally, AB5, our gig worker bill. So you might ask yourselves why we're discussing this um, when in fact this law went into place as of January 1st of 2020. Well, effective July 1st, AB5 may be enforced from a workers' comp standpoint or perspective. What does that mean? That means that if you currently have employees, excuse me, independent contractors that should be classified as employees, um, this will go in, this will be impacted by your workers comp um, uh, rate, uh, not rating, but rather uh, classifications. So whereas prior to independent contractors were not covered by workers comp, if they're misclassified, they may need to be reclassified. And then again, you will need to pay workers comp on them. Uh, if you're not sure how to handle this, how to deal with this, then I strongly encourage you to speak with your um, HR, excuse me, your workers comp or insurance advisor to provide you some guidance and or reach out to us and we'd be happy to walk you through what steps, uh, how to reclassify, what you need to do to reclassify. And we're of course gonna talk about that in the next few um, minutes. Um, so why is it called the gig worker uh, bill? Um, well, it's basically 
um, because it's referred to, you know, the Uber drivers, the Lyft drivers. But it was signed into law in January. Um, uh, it was signed into law in September and went into effect in January, excuse me. And what's the purpose of AB5? Well, it's to protect employees from being misclassified as independent contractors by some employers that uh, just don't want to pay the benefits that come along with being a full-time or an employee. And what are those? We're going to talk about them a little bit. But basically, um, it's overtime and the benefits that you reap as an employee of an organization. So the key takeaways are, you know, AB5 extends classification status, employees classification status to gig workers. How do you determine that? There's a three-pronged test to prove workers are independent contractors and not employees. And we're going to go through that. We'll go through what you did before and what you do now. It is designed to regulate companies that hire gig workers um, in large numbers, Uber, Door, uh, excuse me, uh, Lyft, DoorDash. Keep in mind, there are more than 50 professions and type of businesses that are exempt. These include insurance agents, attorneys, uh, real estate agents, and certain types uh, of business to business contractors and referral agencies, you know, a plumbing contractor, uh, construction, and so on. So when you're determining if somebody is actually classified as an independent contractor or employee versus independent contractor, the definition of employee is workers that are employed by a business person or government entity. In an employee employer relation, the employer generally um, exercises a high degree of control over the wages. You determine how much they make. You determine when they come in and leave what time, uh, sometimes their breaks, uh, their uh, lunch times, and working conditions. Do you want them in the office? Can they work remotely? Uh, which is obviously a changing uh, dynamic in our world as we know it today. Um, then, as a definition, the definition of an independent contractor is workers that are in business for themselves. They are generally free to work for multiple people, uh, at the same time on multiple projects, they can take jobs on a freelance basis, they can concentrate on one contract for 90 days and then move on to another one or do some simultaneously. And generally speaking, they can choose where they work from. Do I want to work from home? Do I want to go to Hawaii and work um, on a project while I'm on vacation? Um, that is the freedom to come and go as they please and uh, work where and when they want is a good uh, gauging point. So how do we determine um, if somebody is an independent contractor? What is the measuring or the metric by which we make this decision? It's called the ABC test. And uh, this was determined in the 2018 Dynamex case where the California Supreme Court ruled that companies must use the three-pronged ABC uh, test in determining how to classify their employers as either an employee or an imp independent contractor. The test assumes that workers are employees unless the company that hires them can prove the following three things, not one of the three, not two of the three, but all three, they must pass this test in order to truly be classified as an independent contractor. So again, the worker is free to perform services without the control or direction of the company. So let's say, for example, you have, you hire an independent contractor to do your marketing. So yes, you have conversations and you discuss how you want them to do it, but you don't tell them how to do it. You tell them, excuse me, you tell them what the end goal is. Yes, I like this, no, I don't like that. So there's an interchange, but you don't tell them how to achieve the goal that you've uh, set out for them. The worker is performing tasks that are outside the usual course of the company's business activities. Uh, so obviously, if, uh, if you're an insurance agency, for example, and you hire a marketer, then they're not doing insurance. So they're definitely doing something that's outside the usual course of the insurance company's activities. 
and the worker is customarily, customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as that involved in the work that they are performing. So what does that mean? That they um, do marketing for multiple companies and they do it um, on a freelance basis. And they also um, more than uh, I would ensure that anybody that does independent contracting work for any of the organizations I work with has their own general liability insurance, has their own business license, has their own workers comp, because then they are truly in business for themselves. So this test holds companies to a higher standard improving workers or independent contractors than was previously uh, used in California. It's the new gold standard requirement um, for companies that hire workers in California. And as you all may or may not know, most employment laws start in California and then eventually uh, the nation follows suit and we, uh, we set the bar here in California. So after cons confirming the ABC test, the man manners and means test is used as a fallback um, where the ABC test does not apply. So this is the basis, basic test for determining whether a worker is an independent contractor or an employee is whether the principal has the right to control the manner and means by which the work is performed. When the principal or the employer has the right of control, the worker would be an employee, even if the principal or employer never actually acts, exercises control. If the principal slash employer does not have the control, the right of control, then the worker will generally be an independent contractor. A lot of words Basically, what that means is the manner and means by which the employee or worker, excuse me, by which the worker does the work determines employee versus uh, independent contractor or IC. So why are these tests so important? Because they clarify what an employer must use to determine and the classification of a worker. Is it truly an independent contractor that you've hired or is it an employee? So the clarification is also is extremely important because employees receive and enjoy a number of protections under the law, which um, was mentioned earlier in the presentation. What are these uh, protections? Overtime pay, meal and rest breaks, unemployment insurance and more, workers comp, uh, benefits, health, uh, PTO, and so on. Um, so in, in order to avoid misclassifications, it, this test has to be adhered to and will protect the worker and the employer. Prior to our ABC test, we had something called the Borello test, which was used previously. And while the language was similar, the AB5, um, with AB5, the test to use is now the ABC three-prong test. So we're going to go through what the question, the questions that most often are received based on um, the new AB5 regulations. Um, so uh, recently somebody asked me, so if I have an option to use the Borello test or the ABC test, what do I use? Absolutely the ABC test. That is part of AB5 and that is how you want to move forward with the um, classification of an independent contractor versus an employee. Does AB5 require everyone who is currently an independent contractor to become an employee? No, you need to, if you currently have employees that, excuse me, independent contractors, then what you would want to do is sit down and go through each independent contractor and determine with the ABC test, do they have, do they meet the three prong test? And um, determine if they have been misclassified and then correct any misclassification going forward. Will employers 
be required to terminate everyone who is currently classified as an independent contractor. No, you do not need to terminate everybody, but you do need to go through the exercise of actually going through the ABC test and classifying and verifying, excuse me, that the classification that they've been um, deemed is correct and accurate based on the ABC test. Will employers be required to enforce strict scheduling requirements and other ha harsh penalties because of AB5? So AB5 does not change the dynamic of how you treat your employees. If you currently offer a flexible schedule, uh, you know, uh, if you currently have like an, an alternative work week where uh, employees work um, for 10 hour days, that all remains the same. Or if you have flexibility with some part-time schedule, that all remains the same. You will just now have to include any independent contractors that were misclassified and are now employees into that, um, uh, into the new, the requirements that you currently exist, that currently exist for your current employee uh, classified workers. Okay. Does AB5 require my employer to pay employee benefits like health care? Yes. Anything that you currently offer existing workers classified as employees and you have now transitioned prior independent con contractors into employee status, they will, be need they will need to receive the same and equal benefits as all your other employees. It is important that you do that and that you do that quickly. And can employers provide employees flexible hours? Yes, that is all deemed by the needs and driven by the needs of your business. You need to stay compliant with all overtime laws, meal and rest break uh, periods, uh, but employers determine and dictate what hours they have their employees work. Uh, will all independent contractors automatically be reclassified as employees? No. Uh, you want to make sure that you go through the three-prong, the ABC test, and verify that you have independent contractors that are truly independent contractors. And many of you will. Many of you have classified um, them correctly already. Many of you have may already be very familiar with uh, the ABC test and have done your due diligence, but make sure that in the event you were to get audited, you have all of that documented. That's very important. Um, in, in order to be able to pass the audit and uh, verify and prove in essence that you have gone through your due diligence and you have clarified um, uh, that you have categorized and classified everybody correctly. Okay. Does AB5 prohibit workers from working as independent contractors? No, AB5 does not prohibit. It clarifies how to classify and what steps need to be taken in order to make sure that no employee and no worker that is misclassified is not reaping the benefits that they are afforded under the protection of the law. That does not mean that there are not true independent contractors. And as I mentioned earlier on, there are certain industries that are exempt from this, insurance agents, real estate agents, and so on and so forth. So I just wanna be very clear. There, are, there is such a thing as an independent contractor status. You just need to make sure that you don't misclassify people in an effort to, you know, quote unquote, save money. Sometimes businesses will do that. And um, it's just, it's, it's uh, a little bit of a recipe for problems and potential litigations in the event of an audit. So I put this in red because I wanted to drive home the point um, of, yeah, there are penalties. The question is, are there penalties for misclassifying workers as independent contractors? Yes, yes, there are. In addition to the wage violations associated with a worker being misclassified as an independent contractor, 
there are civil penalties for willful misclassification. Under Labor Code Section 226.8, which prohibits the willful misclassification of individuals as independent contractors, there are civil penalties between $5,000 and $25,000 per violation. And willful misclassification is defined as voluntarily and knowingly misclassifying an employee as an independent contractor. So I, I, I don't mean to use this as a scare tactic, and, and yet I do, because it is absolutely imperative that you go through the exercise of properly classifying each worker you have. And if you're in that I'm not so sure zone, seek out HR professional guidance and or legal counsel uh, because it is better safe than sorry to pay for a little bit of guidance than to, um, you know, inadvertently, uh, uh, than to inadvertently misclassify somebody and then reap, uh, you know, uh, having to deal with all of the issues that would come after that with penalties and fines and audits, et cetera. Okay, is there a grace period for employees, employers to get into compliance with AB5? The grace period has passed. That was from September of last year until January of this year. That's not to say that if you know that you've uh, may have or have concerns about misclassifying people that you shouldn't just do it right away. So no, there's no grace period and people could come back and potentially, uh, you know, uh, uh, bring forth a claim, but any um, audit would note that the minute you realized you had misclassified somebody, you did make every effort to correct it going on a go forward basis. And of course, the longer you have them misclassified, the more costly it could potentially be for you. Can workers be considered employees under California law if they are not considered um, employees under federal law? Well, the answer is yes. Workers may be considered employees and have protections under California law, even if they are determined not to be employees under federal law. This is because the test to determine employee status, status under California law differ from the test under federal law, such as California has the Fair Labor and Stand Act, Standards Act or the FLSA. So uh, I see some questions coming up and uh, please put your questions in the chat box and we will answer any of these questions that have come up. So the first question I have is, do we need to wait, wait, waive waiting periods when converting, converting an IC or an independent contractor to a W-2? Waive waiting periods, uh, I would say for if you're asking for health and benefits types waiting periods, I would definitely check with your benefits advisor and your health insurance um, agent if that's doable. If possible, then I would say yes, um, but that all depends on how your plan is written and um, what guidance you may receive from them. As a previous IC with my own LLC insurance, EIN, et cetera, can I continue to write software for high tech companies remaining as an IC? Uh, I'm sorry, let me reread this one second. So this person asking this question, you were an independent contractor with your own LLC, et cetera, insurance, et cetera. Can you continue to write software for high tech companies remaining as an IC? As long as the pass, you pass the three-prong test, yes, the answer would be yes. So the next comment I have is, I would look at the exemptions of business-to-business -business contractors 
for most most for the most part they seem exempt um i would agree um, most business to business contractors would at face value appear um exempt and uh definitely be classified as independent contractors if there's any question i would absolutely go through the three prong test and go through the um the process of just verifying in in action in sorry in all uh cases wherever there is any doubt i would strongly encourage everybody to go through the abc test to go through the three questions to make sure and verify that there is no control that um the employee is in fact um doing uh the job uh as and truly classified correctly as an independent contractor that there is uh no right of control by the employer uh when they've classified employees uh, excuse me workers as independent contractors Can the state fund reclassify independent contractors as employees because they do not have a contractor's license? Can the state, so not necessarily. Uh, the contractor's license, uh, I think it depends on what type of a contractor they are. The, um, the this is more of an insurance question and i would definitely you know rather than than air uh give you a, a miss uh rather than give you the wrong answer i would say ask your insurance um i believe that there may be a possibility that they can be reclassified um by state fund but again i would ref i would defer to your insurance agent Any more questions? We have some time, so I'd be happy to answer any more questions. In general, the whole um, independent contract versus employees has been a tenuous uh, topic. There is still a lot of discussion about it um, with regards to, you know, quote unquote, the gig workers. Um, and we, we will see what happens and what pounds out if any further legislation comes up about this. Uh, and I know personally of people who are not very happy with this for your Uber drivers and your Lyft because they feel that restrictions have now been put upon them. So we don't know what the future is going to bring, but for now, uh, again, I strongly encourage you to, um, uh, to review and verify classification of all your workers. So the next question is, can we require independent contractors to be at meetings that are important to the organization? So generally speaking, the answer would be yes, if it impacts the project that they are working on for you. So obviously the example that I used earlier, if you have a marketing person and you wanna have a marketing meeting and you say to that, you invite them, calendar invite X day, please be here. Then yes, you can ask them. They are providing a service and you are, provide, you are paying them for that service. So meetings are absolutely acceptable. However, you cannot, for example, require them to be on a staff meeting on a weekly basis. You can invite them but you cannot require their presence. So I hope that that answers that question. Yes, another key seems to be the amount of supervision that is required, yes. So um, if you supervise every little detail, so it's, it, it, the supervision is basically the control, right? So again, uh, to, not to beat a dead horse, but to use the example of a marketer, if uh, let's say we're marketing, uh, for example, this webinar, and we're sending out invites, and the person we hired to do the marketing, we tell them this is what we want, you know, do it, independent contractor. If we start to say, we want you to do it from our office, we want you to do it every hour on the hour, we need this, you know, then that 
now changes a bit the dynamic because now we're controlling and supervising. Whereas if we say to them, we want them automatically sent out three times a week, do it at your leisure whenever you can, it, it, it is more relinquishes control. So it is definitely the amount of supervision that is required for a said project. Um, and I hope that that answers that that question. But I agree, it the key is definitely uh, um, control or amount of supervision. So is software engineering one of the exempted categories? I believe it might be, but I, I'm gonna have to verify that. And I don't wanna give you uh, the wrong answer. Uh, so let me write that down. And um, I will answer any questions that I'm not 100% sure on, I will verify. And then when we send out the presentations, the answers to those questions will be in the body of the email as well. Any more questions? I would think, though, generally speaking, that um, a software engineer could be an independent contractor if they meet the three uh, prong test, the ABC test, um, and then they could be an employee, depending on um, what the employment contract dictates. So if they're doing it for multiple companies and meet all the other requirements, um, I don't know that they are in the exempted categories, but depending on what the employment agreement is, they could be. If we have an IC and they are asking to be added as an employee, but when we do the ABC test, only two match up, do we have to move them to an employee? So the ABC test um, is all three have to be met to be an independent contractor. If only two are met, they're probably an employee. And I would wanna dig deep deeper into that particular situation. But again, to be an IC or an independent contractor, you have to meet the three standards. If you do not meet the three standards, then it's likely that person is an employee worker versus an independent contractor worker. So we are waiting, I'm waiting for another question. So if you only meet one of the three prong tests for an independent contractor, then they are an employee. Then generally speaking, I would say the answer is yes. If you do not meet all three of the prongs of the ABC test, then that person is likely an employee and not an independent contractor. How is a company's core business defined? For example, what is Google's core business? Google's core business is to inform us all of everything we don't know about. No, I, 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 I just, but um, I think it depends on, um, on what, so what is the core business? Huh, I, I would have to say that, for example, uh, as I mentioned earlier, an insurance agent's uh, agency's core business is insurance, providing services, selling insurance lines of coverage. That would be their core business. They may have other things that they do, uh, but not necessarily um, uh, part of the core. So um, the core, you know, I, I so for example, a construction company, their core is construction. That doesn't mean they don't have plumbing that they do a little bit on the side. I I understand, I, I believe that this question is coming from, how do I know that this person, so this independent, potential independent contractor is not a part of my core business, and then I can then classify them as such. It is really a situational and circumstantial uh, determination that would need to be made. Uh, I apologize if I'm not being um, clear, is this is a very broad question, so it's kind of hard to hone in on exactly 
the answer that you may be looking for. But um, I would ask that um, uh, any of you, uh, whoever proposed this question, reach out to me and we can discuss it in a little more detail. So when is software just defined as a core business? Again, you know, yeah, Google could easily be defined as uh, software, um, but it just depends, you know, that is not um, something that I necessarily would be able to address at this time. More questions? So, Somebody just said, I would look at skills if most of their staff have a set of skills and you bring in a new one or a different language, et cetera. Okay, yeah, that absolutely makes great sense. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. So we're coming up on 945. We still have several minutes where we can answer some more questions. Just bear with us one moment, please. Thank you. Okay, we have contracts with community partners and provide licensed mental health therapists. Hours are determined by community car partners and we do not supervise their work. Would they be considered independent contractors? Uh, so if I'm understanding correctly, so licensed therapists, they provide uh, this type of service to com the community. Uh, the work is not supervised, but the hours are determined. Well, so I would say that at this point, this, this is similar to um, the, can we require employees to come to meetings? So when an independent contractor agrees to a, uh, an employment agreement as an independent contractor, they, would have the freedom to negotiate, yes, I'm available these hours to provide these services. Um, there is no supervision of the work. On the face value of what I'm seeing here, yes, they could be considered an independent contractor. I would wanna go through the three prongs, as I've said, but on the face value of this question, yes, they have their own licenses, they probably have their own insurance, general liability, et cetera. They have, um, I'm sure, um, the appropriate uh, paperwork in place. And so generally speaking, yes, I would say this would be considered an independent contractor. Can you make a checklist and have an IC sign off? A checklist in reference to what? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? If the question is um, the, the ABC, um, checklist i would say that yes you would agree and and i would strongly encourage if you do not have these for your independent contractors make you make sure you have an ic agreement that is either uh drafted or reviewed by legal counsel or hr professional uh because all of that will outline and go through the three prongs and you'll clearly outline and address the fact that they are free to come and go as they please that they have you that you've assigned them a project and the scope of that project and um that you do not have control over when where how so um yes but i rather than a checklist i would use an independent contractor agreement and within that agreement you would have those items you would what would have wanted on the checklist And we're waiting for another question. While waiting for additional questions, review COVID posting. If someone does not have a workplace posters, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So um, for those of you, uh, you know, we're sort of coming out of COVID, not really, but kind of. Um, if you have not received your COVID postings, the FFR, FFCRA postings that are required, or you do not have your workplace posters that outline the employment law, 
um, labor laws that are required to be posted um, at every employer. Please let us know. We will, we're happy to provide those as well as the updated COVID posting. We're happy to assist in any way um, that we can. Um, and um, we do appreciate your participation. Uh, do we have any more questions? And if not, then we will start to wrap up. But again, we have a few more minutes, so we're happy to answer more questions. Briefly, uh, wanted to mention that, as you are all aware, those of us in California are now required to wear the face masks um, when we are out in public, social distancing. Uh, please, please be sure to require that of your employees. Uh, make sure that, um, and the reason I say this is because there are employees that are not going back to work or go to work and then don't want to stay because that those things are not being honored. And it's important that as an employer, you encourage everybody to be respectful and to, um, you know, follow the requirements that were placed out, um, um, out there and that, uh, you know, the governor said, we are required now to wear the face masks um, in our uh, workplaces where we're with other people. Uh, yes, the question is, do the face masks have to be worn in an office? Yes, even in office, uh, particularly in an office, you know, there are those concerns that the recirculated air is one of the things spreading COVID-19. So it is very important that it is followed and the protocols put in place are honored um, and that we hold each other accountable. I mean, you know, I, I will be honest with you, I'm not personally a big fan of the masks because I have asthma and it affects me sometimes, but I do wear it when I'm going to the supermarket. I wear it to be respectful of other people and because we're supposed to, and you know, we, we just, we have to do that. We have to make sure that we, uh, are respectful and mindful of how others feel and that it is it is now required. It's in a requirement in the state of California. Any more questions? Well, uh, again, I wanna thank everybody for joining us um, today. We appreciate your time. We know it's valuable. Uh, my name is Evelyn Blanco. Uh, I am an HR advisor with Outlook HR. And I want to reiterate that the reason we discussed um, AB5 was because of the changes that are the, excuse me, the enforcement that will now be uh, available to be done by workers' comp insurances as of 7-1-2020. We again appreciate your time. We thank you. And should you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. We will be sending out the presentation to everybody along with um, a couple of answers to questions. And um, we will resend the FFCRA postings that you are required to post as a result of COVID-19. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a wonderful day.